Thank you for the very nice introduction. Definitely are very high expectations to live up to. So, you know, we can try hanging out, but I don't promise to be, I, I don't know if I can promise to be that fun. Um, so uh, today I am going to give, I guess now, like um, approximately an hour and 10 minute lecture on an introduction to reinforcement learning. Um, and, and so I think there's a couple of ways in which we can talk about an introduction to reinforcement learning. I could touch upon a lot of different topics. There's a lot of different um, interesting areas of research and reinforcement learning. There's um, exploration. There's just sort of the standard uh, like optimizing for control with model-free or model-based algorithms. Um, there's hierarchical reinforcement learning. Um, there's uh, the exploration, exploitation trade-off. Um, and I, I think instead of, of doing like a very, very shallow definition across like a lot of these different topics, I kind of decided to, um, you know, first I'll, I'll define what reinforcement learning is. And I, and I think it's a little bit different from uh, what you've seen so far in, in supervised learning and in computer vision or NLP. Um, where often there are these supervised or unsupervised methods, there are these algorithms. Uh, reinforcement learning is two things. It's, it's both a framework, like a, a type of problem, and a class of algorithms for solving that problem. Uh, and so I, I want to define that and uh, do a deeper dive into model-free algorithms specifically, so optimizing for control. And what I want you to take away from this tutorial is uh, I, I want you to be able to go and look at all of these papers that are coming out on this topic in reinforcement learning and understand that these aren't just these standalone independent algorithms that are coming out. Um, there are only really a few different families of algorithms that exist, and a lot of these um, named algorithms that you see coming out tend to just be one of these few classes, um, which includes a lot of optimization tricks uh, that have been incorporated to try to just like uh, solve very specific problems. And so after this tutorial, I want you to be able to go and like look at a paper and say, oh, they're just trying to solve like this little problem and they just combined like this bag of tricks. So um, that is the goal. So uh, we're going to do a deep dive into uh, several model-free methods in, re uh, in terms of reinforcement learning algorithms. I don't think we're going to have time to get into like, the model-based set, but I think uh, Doina, who will be going next, um, will, will do a really great job of covering that. And then I want to just conclude with uh, doing an introduction to some open problems in deep reinforcement learning that I'm particularly passionate about. Okay, so with that, um, let's start from the supervised learning lens, because I think most people, hopefully by now, are, are much more familiar with this, right? So um, a very classic problem that people talk about a lot is just image classification. So if we have these uh, images, um, we typically assume that we have access to this data set that has the label already attached to it. And so we just need to train a model that can look at these images of a cat and be able to classify that correctly and correspondingly for, for a dog. And so this is, there's no temporal nature to this problem. So, you know, we may ask, like, what about sequential data? A lot of the problems that we care about uh, in the real world have a temporal component where the decisions that you've made in the past can affect um, what state you're in now and, and what decision you want to make in the future. And so one example of an, a problem that has this type of sequential nature is the game of Go, or you know, any kind of game that you play that has more than just like one decision or like one turn that you make. So this kind of sequential game, we could still represent this as a supervised learning problem, right? So if I have um, this initial, this, this uh, opening, let me see, hold on one second, let me see if I can laser pointer. Okay, there we go. So if I have like this opening state in Go, um, if I know what the correct action I want to take, what is the best action for me to take, uh, I can just, again, just train a regression model that will uh, take in this state and then output this desired action. 
um, and I can decouple that from the next state, so then I'm in some new state of the game, and there I again know what my desired action is, and, and so on and so forth, and I can learn how to play like a grandmaster. So what do we do if we don't actually know what the best moves are? So we know the rules of this game. We are receiving feedback in terms of how well we're doing, but we don't actually have access to an expert who's telling us, okay, you should take this move. Um, so in this paradigm, we want to learn via trial and error. So how do we learn from a reward signal and try to maximize that reward? And so this is exactly what the reinforcement learning framework, the type of problem that we're trying to deal with. So the typical set of assumptions that we make is that our environment is a Markov decision process. And what this means is that um, our assumptions include that we have a state space, a set of states S, um, um, which makes up our entire environment. We have a set of actions. So this is the, all of the possible options that the agent has in terms of things it can do to interact with the environment and change the environment. Um, we have the initial state distribution, so this is the um, initial set of possible states that the agent can receive at the beginning uh, of an episode, in the beginning of the environment. We have the transition dynamics, so these are, this is, the assumption is that the dynamics are stationary, um, that the probability distribution over next states that we see when we are in a state and take a specific action are always going to be the same over time. We have a reward function, so this, uh, this is also stationary, and so we assume that we are going to receive some reward or some probability distribution over a scalar reward after every action that we take. Um, and then we have gamma, which is this discount factor. And so the way that this, uh, this works is that um, at every time step, the agent can pick an action out of that set of actions to take, that action affects the environment, so the environment steps forward and we have a new state. The agent receives that new state or observes that new state, that new observation, and a reward. And so the goal is for us to maximize the reward that we can achieve from this environment. It's pretty simple. Um, so when we talk about maximizing long-term reward, we the simplest thing we can do is just sum up all of the reward that we've seen so far from the environment. So we can either have a fixed time horizon episode or an infinite horizon episode, as in we will just stay in this environment forever. So if we try to sum up over the reward over an infinite amount of time, then it's talking about how do we maximize for infinity doesn't really make much sense. So the way that we make this problem tractable is by incorporating this discount factor gamma. So gamma is a value between zero and one. If the discount factor uh, is one, then it means that we care about trying to maximize the reward over the entire infinite future. If our discount factor is zero, it means that as an agent, we are very myopic, we're very greedy. All we really care about is taking the action that will maximize the next reward that we get, and we really don't care about the long-term future. So I don't know if you uh, are familiar with like games in psychology where you test uh, children for their ability to, to plan ahead. Right? You tell a child, I can either give you one candy now, or I can give you two candies in an hour, um, and you know the children that are saying, okay, I'll wait an hour and get two candies, then they have a larger discount factor. So that's how you can think about it. Yes. Yes, yeah, sorry, I should have prefaced. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me and you can just raise your hand and I'll stop. Yeah, I've always wondered why do we uh, uh, see the discount factor as part of the RL setting and not as part of the agent? Because what you're just describing uh, as part of the children, it seems like it's more part of the, the agent than, than the environment. That's a great question. Uh, and, and I think you can think of it more as like a philosophical choice. So um, choosing different gamma does lead to different um, possible solutions. You can think of it as part of the environment because it basically changes the problem. So we're just saying, you tell me how far ahead I should care 
and I will find the optimal policy for that discount factor. But for any possible discount factor, there, there exists an optimal policy, an optimal strategy. But I don't necessarily care, uh, as an agent, I don't necessarily care which one I choose. Um, as the user designing the algorithm or you know, um, trying to train this agent, like I will have opinions about um, um, what gamut I should choose. And the, and the trade-off is that larger gamma means that um, you're finding a more optimal policy over a, a longer time horizon, but it's also now a much harder problem. Uh, and so I think that that trade-off is something that the user has to decide uh, and and um, when you make that decision, it becomes part of the problem definition for the agent. And so it's just sort of a simplifying assumption. Yeah. Okay. So now that we've been introduced to this RL framework, we can now start talking about or defining some key quantities that we care about. So um, over the course of the rest of this talk, we're we're really going to see these three quantities come up over and over again. So the first is V, which is a state-only value function. So here, this V star means that we're defining the maximum reward that you can achieve when you start from state S for a given discount factor. So, so gamma is, is, is assumed uh, to be provided for this V star. So this V star will be different for different gamma. Um, we next have Q star, so this is uh, called a state action value function. So this is the maximum reward that you will achieve when you start from state S and after taking action A. So this is a value function that uh, gives you the, the uh, predicted return, optimal predicted return that you can achieve for a state action pair. Um, and then the final quantity is, is this pi, this policy. So this is what we typically refer to as the agent. And um, this function, we assume, takes in an action in a state and returns a probability of the agent taking that action when in that state. So we can also define the value functions, the state-only value function and the state action value function for a specific policy. Uh, and so this is typically classified in the problem of, of policy evaluation. So if I have a specific policy given to me already, I can compute what my value function is, or like what my value is for any state or for any state action pair. So that is the reward that you would get, you would get from following this policy. So um, I'm mainly going, so I, I've defined these terms. We're not going to see these ones as much because I will be focusing on, on optimal control. How do we actually find these quantities, the optimal ones, you know, making the assumption that we're trying to train an agent that can maximize the reward that we achieve rather than evaluate a known existing agent. So there's a lot of interesting problems, research problems um, in this domain just with respect to policy evaluation, but I will not be focusing on that today. So when we talk about trying to find this V star or Q star, this optimal solution, um, the strategy we typically take is, is kind of classified as these Bellman equations. So um, this is a, an update rule. So if we can do this for Q star or V star. And uh, what this update rule says is that if I see the reward for a state action pair that I'm in, I can update my Q, um, my Q value for that state action pair with uh, this expression. So I'm going to take that reward that I've seen. I am going to predict what is the best possible um, return that I can achieve from that new state, S prime, that I have reached after taking this action in state S. And this is going to be my new prediction of my optimal return for this state action pair. And we can do the same thing for the state only. So here, we just replace both sides by V star instead of Q star. And this only depends on state rather than state action. And that's it. OK. Um, so that's the update rule for, for learning Q functions. Um, and so now we'll go into a course breakdown of model-free methods. And from here, we're going to dive deeper and deeper into details. So um, Q learning is mainly focused on learning the Q functions, not really about learning a parametrized actor. 
So uh, we've already seen that. Uh, policy gradient, on the other hand, is saying let's, let's ignore these value functions. We don't necessarily need these value functions in order to train the agent. Let's just train the agent directly. And so uh, the objective for policy gradient is directly try to find trajectories and maximize, um, try to find trajectories that maximize the reward, that return like high reward, and that's it. And then we also have actor critic methods, which are a combination of both Q learning and policy gradient. And all this means is that we are training both a parameterized Q function, state action value function, and a parameterized actor. And then we talk about, we'll talk about all the different ways in which we can do that. So let's start from no function approximation yet. Let's just start with like the sim simplest possible learning paradigm where we just have a table. We just have a, a, a table where um, for the Q function setting, we have um, uh, a table that corresponds to all state, all possible states and all po possible actions. So we can initialize this table by just putting some default value, let's say zero for every cell in this table. So now we're saying, initially we're predicting that the Q value for every state action pair is zero. As our agent steps in the environment, we can start filling in the uh, components of this table. So as we uh, see a state, we take an action, we receive that reward, then we can compute this update. So it'll be reward plus gamma times zero. And then we can now fill in the Q value for that state action pair with just that reward. So if we do this over and over again, then uh, the values in that table will start to grow or decrease if we have negative reward. And eventually it will stabilize. And it will stabilize at uh, Q star. So this is something that we can prove that um, there is a single unique uh, Q star table of values. And this update procedure, as long as we see um, as long as we can query the environment for every possible reward for every possible state action pair, then this will converge to the correct solution. So this isn't very realistic because this requires that we have to enumerate all possible states and actions and that we can um, query each one in the environment. And so for a lot of problems that we care about where the state action spaces are quite large, um, this is not gonna be very, uh, uh, it, it would take a long time to implement this. So now let's talk about function approximation. And now we have this possibility of generalizing when we use function approximation. When we parameterize our Q function, it means that we can plug in a state action that we didn't necessarily see at training time and get out some prediction of what the Q value for that state action pair is and, take, uh, and make decisions based on that. So now um, Q as parameterized by theta um, now has generalization capability. So, we have the exact same um, uh, expression here. So now the only difference is that we have this theta term uh, that parameterizes Q. So how do you take the gradient with respect to theta? So we see that theta appears on both sides, right? Um, typically in the supervised learning setting, um, you would only see the parameters on one side, and then the other side is supposed to be your label. It's supposed to be ground truth. It's not supposed to change. So, um, the simplest thing you can do, so, and this, is, uh, this comes from the paper Human Level Control Through Deep RL, which was uh, presented at, um, published in Nature in 2015. Um, <clears throat> the way that they instantiate this is by freezing the uh, right-hand side, fix, uh, fixing these parameters and saying, let's just assume that um, on the right-hand side, I have ground truth, I have this target Q, that I, I know is correct, and I'm just going to use that to update the, my Q function, my theta parameters for STAT. Um, so now we've kind of decoupled the left-hand side from the right-hand side. This is now a Q theta prime because these are old fixed parameters and these parameters are different from the ones on this side. So you can think of it as having two copies of the same neural network um, where um, one is the parameters have been frozen, so they come from some previous time step um, during our optimization procedure, and we're really only updating one of those networks. 
And so we call this like older version the target network because it is the, we're, we're fixing those values, we're saying this is ground truth and, and it is the target that uh, this is trying to regress to. Um, so we can try to make this update a little bit more, uh, this update a little bit more smooth by incorporating a, a learning step. So this is just a smoothing factor alpha, and then we can plug in a one minus alpha in front of the um, like previous predicted uh, value for the uh, current state action pair STAT. And so then this should also look very familiar um, from like an optimization perspective because you can think of this as just like a learning rate. So changing this learning rate changes like how quickly our Q function can update. Um, and so this thing on the right-hand side, we call this our temporal difference error, TD error. Um, and so this is, or, yeah, this is the um, error that we're using when we're computing our gradient with respect to Q theta. So uh, just this very simple instantiation of Q learning using neural networks uh, led to very exciting results, at least very exciting results for 2015. Um, so I'm sure uh, you're all familiar with like Atari, which are these like very simple games, um, computer games um, that have rich observations or from pixels. And so for a lot of these games, DQN was able to achieve a beyond human performance. And so this bar graph shows sort of the, um, um, basically like the performance of DQN relative to uh, human score. Uh, and the figure that we see on the right-hand side here is just a TSNI embedding, just looking at the representation that is being learned from DQN. So you can, you know, so I think you're all familiar now with like representation learning, um, the representations that you can extract from neural networks and like this is sort of like the power behind deep learning, right? If you can take the final, funny, final uh, fully connected layer from a neural network uh, and you can treat this as like a representation. So you can think of this as like a more compact state representation from the pixel observation. And what they found is that if you take a look at this TSNI and you look specifically at um, states that are mapped to be close together in this, um, in this representation, it's too hard to see in this slide. I mean, you would have to zoom in or go, you should go to the paper. Um, there are these different game states that correspond to each of these latent states, but uh, latent states that are getting mapped close together in this representation correspond to states that have similar uh, state action Q values, which is maybe not too much of a surprise. Okay, so there's still a lot of issues with DQN. Oh, yes. Is there a label or? Um, sorry, could you use the microphone? What is the, sorry, what is the color coding on this plot? The, you had some false colors. Is there some labels? Or? Oh, uh, sorry, that's a good question. The colors Thanks. correspond to the predicted value. So red means high value states, and blue means low value states. So, so here, you know, value again means your future discounted return, uh, and so blue just means you're in a state where you're probably going to die soon, um, and red means that you're in a state where there is the possibility that you can achieve high reward. Oh. Okay, can you try to speak? Yes, testing. Is that louder? Can people in the back hear me? Sounds good. Thank okay, you. awesome. Okay. So this, this was an impressive result. DQN was definitely a, a very impressive result, but there's still a lot of instability issues. It requires a lot of hyperparameter tuning. I think maybe all of you have heard about the um, um, so pitfalls of deep reinforcement learning and how difficult it is to reproduce results. And um, all of those things are still generally true, but I, I think things are slowly improving. But you know, back in 2015, the situation was much more dire than it is now. Um, and like you, you take an implementation of DQN and you try to apply it to your problem and you are most likely not going to get a good solution. And, and so one of the problems that you will face is this exploiting Q value. So if you take DQN and, and are training and apply it to your problem and you see that your rewards are just flat and your policies aren't doing anything, uh, go take a look at what your predicted Q values are. And it's very possible that you will see a plot that looks like this. 
So over time, as you're training, so the x-axis here is like a number of optimization steps, um, and your y-axis is, is the predicted value, you're going to see this happen. And so these values are clearly have no grounding on, on the real environment, and, and you basically will see them go until they nan. Um, so what's happening here? The problem with reinforcement learning is that, you know, again, we don't have access to the ground truth, like optimal Q value. So that right-hand side, the, the target value that we keep trying to, to get our Q function to regress to, keeps changing over time. And because um, in, the, uh, in this update step, we have this max term. So if you have a function, an approximate function, that is not giving you the right answer all the time, and you can think of this as like a probability distribution over, over the actual like value that you should be predicting. If you think about this probability distribution, you're, as, as you're doing this optimization, you're basically sampling from this probability distribution constantly. And sometimes you'll get an answer that's close to the, the mean of the distribution. Sometimes, you, like with low probability, you will get an answer that is very far away from the mean of that distribution. The problem is that if you keep sampling and you keep taking the max over that sample, it is very likely that the tar this target value is just going to keep getting larger. So why is that? Why is that? So if we think of, sorry, yes? Yeah, 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 please, oh, oh, oh no. okay. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't a rhetorical question, uh, so if you, if you want to answer, no, okay, all right. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer for you. So if we have this probability distribution and we sample from it once, it is with high probability that sample will be close to the mean. Let's think about like a simple Gaussian distribution. If we sample 100 times, take a max over that, those 100 samples, then it is very likely that, that that max is actually a value that is much larger than the mean. You do this a thousand times. You do this a million times. Think about how high that value is. That's basically what we're doing here. It's even worse because every time we do that update, we're shifting the distribution to match that, that latest max. And so then you can see why uh, this exploding problem can occur. So there was this really nice paper um, at NeurIPS 2010 that proposed a, not a solution, but um, a fix that should make this better. And so this fix is called double Q learning. So one way in which to try and solve this problem is to decouple the two decisions that we're making based off of this Q function. So the two decisions that we're making are, what is the action that I should take? And what is the return of that action? So we're basically doing a max and an arg max. So if we use two Q networks instead of one, we can reduce this bias. So if we have two Q networks that we initialize separately, get trained, um, I mean, trained at the same time and trained with the same data, but at least they were initialized separately and so they should uh, produce like different estimates. One model can be used to predict, to do the argmax, to get the optimal action, and then you can plug that action into the other Q function in order to return the Q value. And so this is one way in which we can reduce this bias. And so that actually works, works pretty well, yes. Yes, for the paper that, uh-huh. Just um, to have a mental map of the evolution of RL. Yes. Uh, so I see that the paper that started everything mm -hmm. was more or less 2015. Yeah. I, I guess that's the starting point of where, where Q learning started to grab attention because it was a na nature paper. And then the fix, the, so, so this started, and then I guess uh, Van Hassel proposed a fix, and it's from 2010. This is a good question that I actually don't remember the answer to. Okay, like, um, we can chat later, because it's yeah. not super important to understand. It's just that the mental map of who came where and who did what. Yes. Thank, thank you. Yes. Um, I want to say that the original Nature DQ1 paper did not use double Q learning, but I cannot say that with 100% certainty. 
Francesca, do you remember? Uh, the double Q learning was in the tabular setting. Yes, 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 yeah. Um, yes, so, right, that makes sense, because 2010 is before neural networks really became popular. So this, this fix was suggested for um, before the um, neural network stage. And I think that there was a follow-up paper implementing this um, with neural networks. Yes, you are correct. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, we're, we're gonna go through like several more tricks uh, that will improve DQN. Um, so uh, another thing that we can do is, is to talk about uh, prioritized experience replay. So in supervised learning, there is this assumption or requirement that we make about our data that is very important, right? And that, that assumption is that your data is IID, like um, independently and identically distributed. This is not an assumption that we rely on in reinforcement learning. It is not an assumption that is true, right? You know, or the data that we're collecting is like over this trajectory. Every data point that we see in the future depends on the data and the action that we took previously. So clearly our data is not IID. So then why would we need to sample IID from our data set, from our replay buffer? There's no reason that we have to do this. So, um, so there, uh, there were later works that explored what are ways in which we can try and um, make the optimization more efficient. Uh, and so one of these is just say, let's throw out this, this assumption that we have to do this uniform sampling from our replay buffer and instead do something a little bit smarter. So in this paper, they actually explored a lot of different kind of, uh, so, so one way you can think about this, what prioritized experience replay is doing is it's changing our uniform probability distribution to be some other probability distribution with which we are sampling. Uh, and so this original paper, which I don't have here and I don't remember the title of, which you can ask me about later, um, tried out a lot of different scoring mechanisms. So you know, one way in which you can think about defining this probability distribution over the samples in your data set or replay buffer is, is through uh, defining a score for each transition, for each data point in the replay buffer. So they found that the scoring mechanism that worked best empirically um, is using TD error. And, and that, that makes sense. So if you think about this again from a supervised learning lens, what we're saying is the data points that our model is worst at is you know, producing a solution that is further, furthest away from the correct solution those are probably data points that we should be reintroducing to our model as quickly as possible so that it can get those right. So that's really all that prioritized experience replay is doing, is that it's computing what the TD error is with respect to the current Q function um, and then sampling those with higher probability. And so the probability is defined here. Okay. Um, and so the, these are just sort of definitions uh, for what the TD error is for vanilla DQN versus the double DQN that we saw previously. Uh, and I'm gonna like skip over this. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Got 40 minutes left. Okay, so I'm gonna try and speed up a little bit. So um, DQN, some other tricks. Uh, this one is honestly kind of quite silly. So this one's also, again, kind of just like a very empirical thing. You can think of, uh, this is actually a, um, a function that I haven't introduced yet. So A is this advantage function. And um, what the advantage is, is it's just the difference, as shown here, it's just the difference between our Q value and our, and our um, state only value function. So it's saying, what is the improvement that I could achieve from taking this action a different action compared to the action I default would have taken under my current policy, which is represented by V. So that difference, that advantage, the advantage that I would achieve from taking this new action um, is defined by A. So you can, so dueling networks, all it's doing is, if I have my neural network 
that's taking in my input state and running it through all of these like convolutional or fully connected layers, it just um, at the end branches out into two different uh, fully connected layers that each are trying to produce, uh, predict the value function, state only value function and the advantage. Uh, uh, sorry, so this is the value function. So it's sort of like a um, you know, larger value that you're predicting and then your advantage is just sort of like a, a much smaller value. And so then if you just sum those two things together, you get your Q value, and for some reason, this actually produces better results than just trying to directly predict the Q function. Um, another possible trick that you can incorporate is multi-step learning. So this is also known as n-step returns. So um, when in the previous Bellman update equation that we've seen, it's th that's what we call a one-step return because we only are taking the first reward that we've seen and saying, I don't need to see anything more. I can now do an update by just predicting, querying the Q function for what the return should be starting at ST plus one. N step returns just mean I'm gonna hold off. Before I update my Q function, I'm gonna wait until I've seen N steps of reward and then query my Q function for the return at ST plus N and use that as my update. So that's a different prediction that um, is relying on more empirical data. Um, uh, and so this is our end step return. So this is now just a multi-step variant of our DQN loss where we're using that end step return uh, instead of just the one step. So this is trade-offs. Um, on one hand, you're getting a more potentially accurate prediction of your Q value for your current state because you're seeing N actual rewards rather than just one reward and then predicting, querying your Q function. But the downside is that it means that you have to wait longer in order to update. So instead of being able to update your Q function after just that one step, you have to wait N steps before updating the state that you saw now N steps ago. Um, and so this, this, uh, that delay empirically often matters quite a lot. So in environments where you have access to dense reward and that reward is deterministic, we typically find that the end step variant performs worse. But if you have an environment where you have stochastic rewards, so your reward that you see changes, um, um, can change every time you query that state action value, or if you have sparse reward, then in those settings you can see an improvement when you use this n-step model. Okay. So um, one of the, I think this is one of the final trick, DQN tricks that I'm going to talk about is this, uh, actually no, this isn't the final one, but uh, distributional, Q, uh, distributional reinforcement learning. So this was a really nice uh, paper by Mark Belmar a distributional perspective on reinforcement learning. So this is now 2017. Uh, and in, so in standard reinforcement learning, you know, what we've always talked about is this prediction of our value. It's a scalar. It's an expectation of our value. Belmar, what he proposes instead is let's model our value distribution rather than the expected value. So now this incorporates uncertainty. So I'm saying, I don't know for sure that, that you know, the return that I will achieve from this state is 10, but maybe 90% um, maybe it's 10 and 10% it's two. And so that conveys a lot more information than just having like a weighted uh, the expectation over those, over those two things. So um, in practice, what he proposes is that you can model your value function as this categorical distribution. Um, and then you can see how all of the update components of doing a Bellman update, you can, you can do to a scalar, but you could also do to this categorical distribution. So the next step is, is applying your discount factor. And so that just sort of squeezes your categorical distribution together. Um, you now apply, you now add to it the reward that you just saw from your environments, and so this is going to now shift it in one direction or the other. And then now you need to project it back into the space of categorical distributions that you can actually um, model. And so this is just projecting this, uh, this like uh, um, new categorical distribution back into the space of the ones that you're modeling here. And then you can just keep doing this over and over, and this is now distributional Q learning. Um, okay, so um, noisy nets is again sort of like a 
another trick that was incorporated into DQN. So I haven't really, yes, question. Hi, um, so what's the benefit of um, instead of using the expected value and made it as a distribution? I mean, it, it, at the end, you, uh, when, when we evaluate the action, we, all, we still use the expected value of the distribution anyway, right? It's more expressive. Um, so, uh, and I guess we actually haven't really talked a lot about um, how we are using this Q function in order to uh, make decisions yet, right? Um, so, like you said, in the end, like we still need some sort of uh, scalar value. We're probably just taking an argmax over that in order to decide what action that we take. But um, in order to have made it to that decision, we've, we've had to do all of these updates over time, right? And DQN, the way that they've trained it in Atari is it took like a million time steps of training. So over all of those updates, even if you're in the end, you're just still gonna distill it down into a scalar value, all of that additional information is probably still useful for that update. Um, and so that's kind of like the idea behind this distributional perspective is that if we have access to that information, to that uncertainty, if we can actually model like the true stochasticity of the environment, we can probably get better performance. Uh, and so, and I, and I think like empirically this, this does track. Yeah. Yes, another question. Yeah, uh, so in this paper, when we take a distribution, so here we kind of doing reparameterization, re which is kind of equivalent to reparameterization re trick in variational autoencoder compared to autoencoders. Can we think about that in that way? Sorry, do you mind speaking up a bit? Uh, just like yeah, when we take the distribution uh, instead of expected value. So here we, I feel it's like similar to uh, the reparameterization re trick in variational autoencoder compared to the autoencoders. Mm. Can we draw like some like analogies between like those two perspectives? Yeah, that's a, uh, it's a very good point. Um, and I think what you're pointing to is how do we actually parameterize this distribution? So if you're using the reparameterization trick, typically what it means is that um, you're, uh, well, when we talk about the reparameterization trick, we are always talking, we only really, or I only know of like, um, when we use Gaussian distributions, right? So the reparameterization trick is with respect to the variance for the Gaussian distribution. So that doesn't really apply here because um, at least like in this paper, the way that they instantiate this distributional reinforcement learning is with a categorical distribution. So basically they're binning and like assigning a probability per bin rather than um, uh, to like doing this procedure over a continuous, over a Gaussian distribution. You can do that. I don't know if they did that in the paper or if other people have tried it later, but you can definitely think about this from a, like a Bayesian perspective um, and then talk about doing like a Bayesian update with this, in which case maybe the, um, it would be much easier to do that with Gaussians and then the reparameterization trick could apply there. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's a, definitely an interesting exploration to look into how you would implement this with continuous distributions. Yes. Um, I have one more question. Could yes. you explain how this discount factor is really shrinking the dis distribution? Is it, isn't it just like a scalar value you multiply it with or what is it exactly? Uh, so the, why is it being like, why does it shrink towards zero? Why does it shrink towards zero in this B step? Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, so it's shrinking it towards zero because this gamma is a value that's less than one. But does it change like the value of the probability distribution itself? Wouldn't it then be like less? 
Right. Yeah. So which is why it's um, basically uh, shrinking the distribution towards zero. So it's it's so um, you can think of like each of these bins as like a is a scalar value, and you're basically applying that discount factor to each of those scalar values independently. And so um, if you think about these values and let's make a simplifying assumption that they're all positive, then the bin on the leftmost side is a smaller value than the bin, the rightmost bin, right? So if you apply a multiplicative, the same multiplicative factor to each of those bins, then this value is going to shrink less than the largest value. And so that's why your distribution both becomes more compact, but also moves towards zero. Because all of the values are getting smaller, but they're getting smaller at different rates. All right, thank you. Awesome. These are really great questions. I really appreciate that you're asking them, because it means that you're still paying attention. Um, OK, so, so noisy nets. So um, one thing that I haven't really talked about, I've kind of brushed under the rug, is the exploration problem. So this is a, actually a, like a very hard problem in its own right in reinforcement learning that a lot of people study, which is what is the best way it, for us to collect data um, from the environment that will allow us to find the optimal policy faster? Um, and so this is kind of a hack that is like um, specific to like the function approximation setting, which is saying um, if I can take my Q function or I can take my, 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 my parameterized function and I can just add noise to the weights, to the parameters, and if I do that, then that's going to perturb the predicted value that I get out. So this is just sort of like adding some noise so that I can um, Rather than fully exploit, when we take actions from the environment, sometimes it means I'll take an action, uh, what I think is a suboptimal action, but maybe an action that will allow us to, that would give us more information about the environment and allow us to find like a better policy in the end. Um, and so this is just a, a, tr a trick for improving exploration. So all of these tricks are things that went into this paper that was called Rainbow DQN, Rainbow um, or Rainbow Combining Improvements in Deep Reinforcement Learning. And um, so they, they basically did a very thorough empirical overview over all of these tricks that had been proposed by different papers in the past. Um, and they show how they can actually all be combined. Like they all are fixing different problems and they all actually complement each other and lead to a method that gives us much better performance compared to a vanilla DQN. So I think, yeah, vanilla DQN is actually down here, and so all of these different uh, colors correspond to um, combinations of those tricks where we're eliminating various ones, and so we can sort of see how that trick actually corresponds to improved performance, and we, if we combine all of them, then we achieve sort of this result up here. That's it. It's all just tricks. Okay. So this has all just been about Q-learning. I still have to, in the next... Uh, 25 minutes, like talk about policy gradient methods and open problems that I care about. So I might try and like hurry up a little bit more. But um, the downsides of Q learning um, is that we've we've spent so much time talking about tricks for like solving these like inherently difficult problems that that are. Um, well, just inherent to Q learning. And so the, these instabilities and the divergence um, that they cause are, are because of three main factors. So one is function approximation. So when we move from the tabular setting to linear function approximation or nonlinear function approximation with neural networks, um, then, you know, like the overestimation bias, this is, an, uh, this is, cause, this is a cause of divergence. Um, Two, which is something that is like much harder to avoid, is just and is inherent to Q learning, is just bootstrapping. This isn't supervised learning. We don't have access to the optimal value function. We're just trying to discover it through trial and error. Um, and three is off-policy training. So um, we're collecting all of this data from the environment. A lot of that data can be very far from the optimal policy or the policy that we're currently using to collect that data. And so when we're updating with this very off-policy um, data, then it also leads to a danger of instability because it means that we're updating our, our, our parameterized function 
on state actions that we very rarely see and not updating it more often on state actions that, um, we, uh, that, we, that we are using or querying our Q function more often to make decisions on. Uh, and so it means that, that those values are, can be drifting. So these are all the problems that we're trying to uh, fix with these tricks. Yeah. Um, another downside of Q-learning, which is inherent to the problem definition, is that it's very difficult to implement this for continuous action spaces, right? So the way that we've talked about getting an action out of a Q function is by taking this argmax. You can really only take an argmax if you have a discrete set of actions that you can use to query this Q function. So we could do this with a continuous action space by sampling a bunch of values uniformly um, and querying the Q function with that, but this isn't really gonna be tractable for very high dimensional action spaces. Um, so what can we do to solve that? So policy gradient does solve some of those problems. So you know, instead of trying to do things in this roundabout way where we're predicting a value function and then using that value function to tell us what action to take at every time step, we can instead just directly train a parameterized actor um, and you know, use the power of SGD or gradient ascent in this case to try and, and um, um, improve the reward over trajectories like a, 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 and, and train that directly. So, um, so now we're gonna be parameterizing that policy pi. So, uh, and, um, and so yeah, our tau here just means the cumulative re reward along this trajectory output by this policy. So um, if we have defined this objective, which is very simple and, and I think like quite intuitive, but now we have to take the derivative with respect to this objective in order to um, try to optimize for it. And um, so, uh, so if we take the derivative, then um, one of the things that comes out is that we are, so we can pull out the reward because it doesn't depend on theta, um, but what does depend on theta is this log probability of us, of us taking this trajectory tau. And so this is called a score function. So the score function helps to calculate a sampled measure of the gradient of the expected return of a parametric policy with, with respect to its parameters. Um, and so we really need to be able to compute this. It is very difficult to compute this, unfortunately, because this incorporates both the policy stochasticity, like the, the, probability, um, the probability distribution over actions of the policy, but also the dynamics of the environment, because the dynamics of the environment also dictate like, what states we actually see in this trajectory. And while it is easy for us to take the gradient with respect to our, our policy because it's parameterized and so we can just query it very easily, it is much harder to do that with the environment. So it turns out that we can separate this out into its different components. So this log probability of a trajectory, we can now roll this out um, and this separates out into different log probabilities corresponding to the probability of your initial state the summation over your um, uh, log action probability at each state, and then the probability of you achieving ST plus one from STAT. So these shaded components are specific to the environment. They don't depend on theta, which means if we're taking the derivative, those go to zero. So we can just ignore those, we can throw them out. Um, and so that gives us just uh, this expectation, which only now incorporates the log probability of the policy. And so this is known as the policy gradient theorem, the, the fact that we can compute the um, gradient, the policy gradient in this way. And so in practice, we can estimate this expectation by just sampling trajectories under our current policy as parameterized by theta, um, and so then, you know, if you take n trajectories, and here n usually equals one before we do an update, then uh, we can compute this derivative. We can also talk about an off-policy version of policy gradient, um, but this means that we have to incorporate this important sampling factor. Uh, and so now we are saying, um, if I have access to this data that was collected under a different policy, um, beta, 
then um, I can still use it to update my current parameterized policy, but um, I need to weight it differently. And so that's what this important sampling factor does. So the pro is that we can now use off-policy data, which means we can be much more efficient and we don't need to throw away data right after we update our policy with it. But the downside is that this factor can explode. Um, this, this factor can lead to instability if we are using data points that are very rare under our behavior policy. So the simplest instantiation of, policy, of this policy gradient theorem or this result is reinforced. So this is also called uh, Monte Carlo policy gradient because we're just doing the most simple, most simple and obvious thing which is um, we are computing the estimated return here um, using a Monte Carlo method, which just means that we are um, using our actor, deploying it in the environment, collecting a trajectory, computing the actual return of that trajectory, and using that to compute the derivative and update. Um, okay. So the downside of this method is that if you use this naively, um, if your environment has too many positive rewards, then it's actually quite difficult to update your policy to maximize over them um, because we really want to only pinpoint sort of like the best possible trajectory. Um, one simple way to get around this is to incorporate a baseline. So I just want to pick some constant scalar factor with which I can um, offset all of the returns over all of the trajectories that I sampled under my policy. Uh, and this can just be any function that only depends on state. So one really simple one that you can use is just the mean over all of the rewards. And so you can also think of this as, as the state only value function. You can use v, v of s, because that doesn't depend on a, as our baseline here. Um, so policy gradient is great because we can actually use this for continuous action spaces. If your data are on policy, then it actually learns quite quickly and you don't need to use this important sampling factor. Um, but if your data is on policy, it means that you need a massive amount of data. Why? Because you need to collect several trajectories worth of data in order to compute that Monte Carlo return, in order to do your gradient update, as soon as you do your update, your actor is changed. So that means all of that data that you've seen so far is no longer on policy, and you would have to use an important sampling factor um, in order to reuse that data. And so it's much easier often empirically to just not do that and throw it away. Um, so often, uh, so PPO is like a, commonly used policy gradient method, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about the tricks involved in, in getting that to work better. But um, PPO for a lot of environments can take like tens or hundreds of millions of data points in order to reach a good policy. But the upside is that it's actually much easier to use than a lot of Q learning methods. And what that means is that it requires a lot less hyperparameter tuning to work in a new environment. So those are the trade-offs. Um, with this kind of like, uh, with reinforced specifically, this kind of Monte Carlo method, your reward estimation is not often accurate because you're just doing these random rollouts. So especially if you have an environment that is very stochastic, whether it's in the dynamics or the reward, then um, this is not going to work very well. And also what this means is that your tail value is not very accurate. So for trajectories that you don't see often, for state action pairs that you don't see often, then um, this is not a very good estimate of your reward. Okay, so the reason that I've really only covered this like one very naive algorithm under policy gradient is that a lot of methods that we call policy gradient technically are actor critic. So uh, if you remember what I said before, actor critic methods consist of um, parameterizing both models, your Q function as well as your actor. And so um, there's a lot of different ways in which we can combine those. So, if you think back on this policy gradient method where we had to estimate the return in this Monte Carlo way, I think it should be pretty obvious that another way in which you can do that is just querying your parameterized Q function. If you have a parameterized Q function, you can just use that and the amount of data that you need in order to compute an update is now much, much less. So, um, uh, so I've already talked about this baseline. We can use the state-only value function for this, in which case now your um, 
return that you're computing is basically just your advantage function. Um, so policy gradient in practice, most of the instantiations that you will actually see in papers is instead of doing that Monte Carlo return, just plugging in the Q function. So we can use um, basically like old fixed parameters for that Q function and it leads to this implementation of policy gradient. Okay, so um, TRPO, which I don't remember what year it came out in. I think it's been about four years, four years, to maybe it was 2018. Um, so TRPO is, is, does basically this. It uses um, a parameterized Q function, um, but in order to try and stabilize the training, what it does is let's, we want to take baby steps in our optimization. Right, so because this Q function is based on an older policy, um, a stale version of the policy, in order for us to be able to use it effectively and keep this ratio like not too large or not too small and um, to keep this stable, then we want to make sure that our policy doesn't change too much. So we can do this with this regularization objective that says I'm going to try and make sure that my the KL divergence or like the uh, some notion of distance between my the probability distribution um, under my old policy from my last optimization step and my current policy is not too large. Um, and you can implement this uh, in practice by computing the Lagrangian where uh, you take this objective and then you just have like a small negative coefficient on um, this KL on this KL term. So um, very quickly after TRPO, they actually came up with like a, a improvement. So this is now proximal policy optimization PPO. And it turns out that you can actually do something much cruder and it works better um, because it's a lot easier to do the crude thing than to try to compute this KL divergence, which is quite difficult. So the thing that PPO does is it just clips. So um, basically, if, you, if your update that you would apply to your policy is too large, we're just going to clip it. If it's too positive or if it's too negative, we're always going to clip. And so we're basically um, forcing the update that we would apply to our policy to be within a specific range. It's a very empirical hack, but it works very well. Um, so then, uh, David Silver came up with this really nice paper, Deterministic Policy Gradient Algorithms, and what he realized is that the policy gradient theorem doesn't only apply to stochastic policies. It is actually much easier for us to instead instantiate a deterministic policy. And he actually realized that um, the de a deterministic policy, so now we're parameterizing this differently. Now we're parameterizing a policy where we take in the state and output and action, so we're now denoting that by mu, um, parameterized by theta. Um, and we can actually consider the deterministic policy as a special case of the stochastic one. So if you take the original policy gradient theorem and you Define your stochastic policy instead as a combination of mu, a deterministic policy, and a variance variable, sigma, then as sigma goes to zero, you just get the deterministic setting. So then he basically showed that this, um, we can do, uh, that the that there exists a, a deterministic version of the policy gradient theorem. And now we can just apply this to any existing policy gradient method. Um, and uh, the, the nice thing about deterministic policy gradient is that uh, it's much more sample efficient to compute that return um, because you're much more likely to get an accurate estimate of a deterministic policy with a single trajectory rather than a stochastic one. So um, deep deterministic policy gradient, DDPG, so this came out in 2016. Um, so here we're just using deep networks to represent the policy and your Q function. The problem with deterministic policy gradient is that um, because your policy is deterministic, then exploration becomes more of an issue. So now we need to decouple the policy that we're learning from the policy that we're actually using to collect data. So we're incorporating noise into the policy when we actually use it to collect data from the environment in order to improve that exploration. 
Um, we can save these trajectories into a replay buffer and sample from it off policy, um, and then uh, do deterministic policy gradient on this whole shebang. So then there was a distributional version of this. Uh, so now this is D4PG, so people really liked the letter D and just kept adding to it. But um, really, it's just an improvement on um, DDPG that allows you to use more actors, so multiple distributed actors. So this is really kind of like the core component of this method was, is there any way in which we can speed this up by using multiple versions of the environment, multiple actors, so that we can collect data much more quickly? And so we're all we're operating under the assumption that we're in a simulator, that we have a simulator, that we have a simulated environment, and so data collection is easy here. Um, and then other tricks that we should be pretty familiar with. Um, and then you know 2018, so this is you know keeps on trucking along. Um, this is now TD3. So TD3 again, it's just hacks that have been incorporated to uh, this deterministic policy gradient, you know, where we are, again, just trying to fix the overestimation issues with the Q function, where we are in instantiating two independent models and then using the minimum for predicting the value. So then this gives us like a pessimistic estimation of our value function. We are um, smoothing out or the target policy update. So now we are smoothing um, and trying to like limit how, how much we change the target for both the Q function as well as the policy. Um, uh, or so, Sorry, both of these tricks are, are kind of doing it to both the target and policy. We're delaying the update and uh, smoothing the policy. Uh, and then from TD3, very similar to TD3 is soft actor critic. And so um, in instantiation, soft actor critic is very close to TD3, but I, it, it introduces a novel concept that I want to kind of like slow down a bit and, and talk about. Um, so soft actor critic, uh, we go back to having a, a stochastic policy, but the idea behind soft actor critic is quite nice. So um, soft actor critic comes from this maximum entropy framework. And the idea here is there is a single unique Q star. There is only one optimal Q function for an environment. But there are potentially infinite optimal policies that can achieve that Q star. And that makes optimization very difficult because then you have like no guarantee that you're going to converge to a single policy. You could be jumping across different policies and, and um, when you only really want to converge to one. So one way to solve this problem is to say, I don't just want any policy. I want to converge to a, a unique solution. So one way to define that unique solution is to say, I want the maximum entropy policy. I want the policy that can achieve this Q star, but also has the um, um, accumulated over all state action pairs, the maximum entropy in terms of the, the probability distribution over actions. So when you say that, you've now defined just a single policy um, that we're trying to optimize for. Um, another argument is that the maximum entropy policy gives you better exploration. And so it's a lot, um, um, it means that it will be more robust and, and potentially perform better in, uh, in the actual environment. So in order to implement soft actor critic, we need to train parameterized versions of all three of these values that we've seen before, the state only value function, the state action Q function, um, and the uh, parameterized actor. So this is all very straightforward. It's all just very simple regression objectives that you know obviously still incorporate bootstrapping, but um, um, we just want to match the state value function with what it should be as defined by the Q function and policy. Um, same thing with our Q function. This is now a DQN-like step, so we're doing Bellman update. Um, so our target here is, is using the, uh, now using the value function. So all of these, basically all three of these updates are using all of the other uh, components. And then in order to implement this maximum entry policy, we are trying to get our policy to match um, the, uh, so this, this maximum entry policy is defined as this 
softmax over our Q function. So we can take our Q function and turn it into a probability distribution over actions by, do it, by doing this softmax. So um, Z here is just like a partition function so that we can force this to be a probability. Um, but in practice, you know, this is how we define that maximum entropy policy. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm rushing because I only have three minutes left. So, uh, so a problem with SAC is that um, in practice, you have this temperature term that we're actually using to say how much we actually care about how high entropy the policy is. And it turns out that on a per environment basis, like how you choose this temperature really matters. So a modification on SAC that came out, I think like a year later or less, um, is basically we're just gonna make this a parameter that we can optimize for directly, and it's now something that we don't need to tune. Um, and so uh, that basically just means that in our SAC update, we have now this like additional param parameter uh, alpha for the entropy um, that gets optimized for. Um, okay. I, I think I'm gonna end here because I have two minutes left. Um, so I think Doina will cover model-based methods. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. I, like uh, there's, again, sort of, you know, lots of issues, a lot of different ways in which you can use a model. Um, but there's the kind of open problems in deep reinforcement learning I was gonna talk about uh, was um, mainly to do with generalization. So um, one of the things that is very obviously built into supervised learning problems is that you need to generalize to new data at test time, right? You're going to see samples, you're gonna see inputs that you didn't see at training time. In the reinforcement learning framework that I introduced in the very beginning, it's kind of unclear what new state you would see at test time, right? And so um, this was a problem that kind of got surfaced in 2018, um, 2019 in a lot of these papers that said, well, we can modify our state. We can, we can try to create like a train test split, split in the same way that we have it in supervised learning and see how well these agents can actually generalize to new inputs. And it turns out uh, the answer is very poorly. Um, and so then there's a, a lot of work on, you know, how can we fix this? And um, Unfortunately, I can't get to it, but uh, you know, find me after. I'm happy to chat about this. This is sort of what my research is mainly in, so I focus on this so I can talk your ear off. Um, but you know, thank you so much for listening to me for the past hour and 20 minutes, and I'm happy to take any other questions that anybody might have. <laughs>